Good evening, everyone. I'm Kate Levesque, head of school at Ursuline, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's presentation of Ursuline's 75th anniversary speaker series. Tonight's featured speaker is Molly Burrams, an internationally recognized leader in cartography, social entrepreneurship, conservation, and innovation for faith-based, impact-driven property use and management. And that's certainly a mouthful, but I know that Molly is gonna break that all down for us in just a minute. Our thanks to all of you for attending this evening. One of the goals of our 75th anniversary celebration has been to strengthen the ties of our community. And with your participation here tonight, we're delighted to continue doing just that. With us tonight, we have students, parents, faculty and staff, alumni, past parents, grandparents, neighbors and friends from here in Dedham and across the United States. Just a couple housekeeping items for us. As you've seen already on your screen, tonight's uh, presentation will be recorded. Uh, Molly Burms will speak for approximately 30 minutes. And after that, we welcome your questions. Questions can be answered into the chat function by sending them to the host which is titled Ursuline Chat. So during the presentation, please feel free to add your questions and we behind the scenes will get them to Molly. Also during the presentation, if you have a question that you'd like to ask at the end, we encourage you, you could also use if you'd like to speak directly to Molly, to use the small raise your hand feature, which is part of Zoom. Um, and uh, for those of you who use Zoom regularly, you'll know where exactly where that is. Um, so you might wanna take a second and familiarize yourself with that if you'd like, uh, but the raise your hand feature will also catch the attention of those who will be monitoring the many screens we have with so many participants tonight. It's now my pleasure to introduce one of Ursuline's students. Sarah Wheeler will serve as the moderator for this evening, and she in turn will also be introducing Molly to us. Sarah is a resident of Needham, Massachusetts, entered Ursuline as a seventh grader, and is now a senior and a member of the class of 2022. She is dedicated to her studies at Ursuline and is enjoys, enjoys being involved in the school community, whether it be as an intern in the iHub, which is Ursuline's makerspace, captain of our robotics team, or a soprano in the choral group. Sarah's two main interests are biology and Spanish language and culture. Outside of school, she's heavily involved with agriculture and works, leads, and volunteers at local organic farms. Much of Sarah's passion for the field of biology and the use of science as a force for good stems from her direct experiences working on farmland. So Sarah, it is my pleasure to introduce you and hand the program over to you. Thank you, Ms. Levesque for that introduction and thank you all for being here tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Molly Burhans, an activist and founder of Good Lands, who is using cartography to map the worldwide holdings of the Catholic Church as an inventory of ownership and potential investment for society, health, security, and ecological justice. Molly has received awards and recognition for her work from organizations such as the Sierra Club, the United Nations, and National Geographic. Will you please join me in welcoming Molly Burhans, who has prepared a wonderful presentation for us this evening. Thank you so much, Sarah. And it's so wonderful to be here with all of you tonight. And I, I'm really grateful for your time. Um, and to share my journey and hopefully hear some of your questions and enter a dialogue. Um, just kind of a little bit of formatting for the start of this. So I'm gonna begin this presentation really diving into what I actually do. Um, some of it may be at different levels of technicality. So please do not be afraid to ask your teacher or someone in this chat to follow up. Um, if you have questions about specific parts of it, and I'll get back to it, those questions as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> perhaps outside of this, you know, defining terms and things. Um, but I've tried to make it general. There are some things like w regarding data that um, might be unfamiliar, though. And please 
uh, don't be afraid to ask uh, me or anyone. Um, then the second half of it is going to really dive into my journey to this point. Um, and I had the um, humbling experience of taking out my uh, yearbooks from high school and just thinking about where you are potentially right now in high school right now, there's always similarities across generations, I think. Um, I don't think we're full generation apart though, we're like a half generation. But um, I'm also really just proud of all the high school students, um, all the elementary school students, everyone that's been keeping on in this pandemic. I can't imagine the unique challenges you've faced. Um, I just wanna call that out before we start. So ask questions. I can't answer them immediately. And the first is technical and the next is story. So um, let's get started. So this is the third logia of the Apostolic Palace. The Apostolic Palace is in the Vatican City State. And I was 26 years old when I found myself for the first time of many on this floor being guided down this hall by Swiss guards. The hall is covered in the most exquisite maps that I'd ever seen. It was like a cartographer's heaven. And I'd been searching for over a year looking for just a map of the boundaries of the church called diocese, um, whether it's an archdiocese like the Boston archdiocese or regular diocese like the Bridgeport diocese. And they couldn't find any global map of this or even Episcopal conferences, which is the level of the USCCB, so US Conference of Catholic Bishops. And I'll be defining these terms in a couple of minutes, but basically I couldn't find any maps of the church. And I was really just thought I must have missed something or maybe they didn't make them public because there was no security standard. And to my surprise, the Catholic church globally hadn't had a map update since the frescoes were made. I sat down with some, some priests that were part of the secretary of state. I asked to speak with the cartographer for the Vatican. We don't have one. I asked to speak with their geographer and they told me, we don't have one. And the irony is being in this hall full of maps and coming to the realization that we hadn't understood ourselves globally, not just now, but really ever, because the church only became completely global, reaching every corner of the earth with its jurisdictions in the past century. And we'd never visualized that. So at the time, I had been given permission to lead a lab. Uh, which had just finished the administrative three boundaries. So I'll get into this. So pe pretty much they mapped the boundaries that are like counties for the World Health Organization and the CDC. And these were used to help gather data and track, measure, and contain the Ebola epidemic that had erupted around this time. And those maps are definitely have been put to use this pandemic. And following them, we made an entirely new kind of boundary map of the church. And these were premiered in 2016 uh, at the Vatican Arts and Technology Council. These are some of my maps in Casino Pio 4, which is um, where the Pontifical Academy of Sciences is housed. And the Academy of Sciences is academy within the Vatican. While this was going on, Stephen Hawking was upstairs discussing AI um, and ethics. And in these halls, Galileo, the founding president, has walked, been house arrested. Um, following him, there was Bohr, um, Heisenberg, many of the great names of science that you'll hear have all kind of been in this place. And for the first time, prelates, priests, bishops, cardinals, administrators who govern the global church could actually see it. Now, how this journey happened, I've mentioned, I'll go into a bit later, but at this time, I was dirt poor. <laughs> I had had access to this huge lab, but I was pretty much living on the equivalent of a graduate student's stipend. So I was allowed to crash in the Domus. This is where the Pope lives. So every day at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I'd see the Pope at meals and I'd sit 
in the middle of the cafeteria at this place called Doma Santa Marta, alongside cardinals and bishops, many of them from Syria, and we talk about geopolitics and the situation for Catholics in their areas, whether it was the Middle East or India. There were a bunch of priests from India as well. And I would go back to my room, which you can see on up here. There's me in the window reading Hildegard von Bingen. And this is the chapel where if you see Pope Francis's daily mass, that every morning he says mass in. And I'm having a kind of a selfie moment there with the Pope Mobile. So I had this kind of wild journey. And this was one of the many times that I've been back to the Vatican. And in 2018, I returned once again. And Pope Francis gave me permission to establish the first female founded institute in the history of the Roman Curia. And this would be the first scientific institute practicing science, um, really since the observatory, the Vatican Observatory was founded to create the Gregorian calendar that we use today. The day of the week, the month, right now, how we determine that is based on the calendar that was created by the Catholic Church in response to the former calendar being not quite correct with its calculations. And they had better instruments and they improved it. And so now I had this opportunity to establish this new mapping institute. Now, this came with a minimal budget uh, and needed a lot more resources and correct kind of alignment. So I'm currently renegotiating this. Um, as you can imagine, this is mid-2018, so it takes quite a while to move things in the Vatican, but I'm hopeful that this will happen eventually. The journey that I've been on to get here is not expected. Um, I had no idea when I was your, any of your ages in high school um, that I would ever meet the Pope. I actually wasn't even a practicing Catholic. And it's been a winding, amazing journey through education, which has been a critical part of this, through entrepreneurship, through embarrassments, through excitements and triumphs, and all the way to Rome. A bit of background about the Catholic Church, just for context. So about 18% of the world's population is Catholic. 26% of healthcare facilities globally are run by the Catholic Church. It's the largest non-governmental network of healthcare. And 35 million children are educated a year within Catholic schools. And the Catholic Church, it runs the largest non-governmental kind of NGO network of humanitarian aid. That is second, if you include all networks of humanitarian aid to the entire United Nations member organizations. And not surprisingly, they own a lot of land. And this is a map of Catholic properties within the USCCB. It should be a video that's playing. We'll continue. So they own cemeteries, chapels, convents, elementary schools, hospitals. And when I say they, I'm talking about a large umbrella. So it's not just a single diocese that we're talking about here or the Vatican. It's the network of Catholic institutions, including Catholic educational institutions, Catholic healthcare, dioceses, religious orders. And these are all illuminated on this map of the US. And this one particular property is where this idea came to me. It's the convent where I was discerning vocations to become a farmer nun at the time and really started to think about the scale of Catholic land and how this could be potentially a powerful force for change, especially in the face of the climate crisis. So what even is a map? To start off, this is a polygon. It's a shape. And this shape on a map delineates the Potomac River watershed with all of its unique hydrology, geology, species, human development patterns, Sorry, I'm going to see if this video is playing. And these can all be viewed as layers on a map. And this is a line. It shows the boundary between Turkey and Syria. This line delineates a geopolitical boundary that impacts lives every single day with dire consequences. 
And any bird nerds in the audience might recognize these. These are migratory flyways of the world. The paths and areas that birds fly north and south throughout different times of the year. And back in 2016 is when I led that lab and we led the world to create a new vision, a new illustration of the planet that had never been done before. It was a geo-religious perspective. So these boundaries that just came up, these are the dioceses that I mentioned. And right now I'm in the Buffalo diocese and you can see there's about 3000 of them. This was the first time that any major world religion had been mapped on its own territories. Um, and I say that with some apprehension though, because many major world religions actually aren't quite as organized as the Catholic church. So in a sense, the 1.3 billion are organized through these geographies. Some terminology here is really looking at these different scales of Catholic geography that we mapped that hadn't been mapped before. So this is the upper scale. This is kind of like countries, but it's called Episcopal conferences or bishops conferences. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. So like the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, but they don't measure one-to-one -one for countries. So you can see in North Africa, that's the North Af African Bishops Conference and it encompasses several countries. The level of administration down from this in the Catholic Church is called a province. So a province is at least one archdiocese and a diocese, which is why you have these kind of gaps in this level, because these are all actually special types of mission territories. And a province is overseen by whichever bishop or cardinal administers the archdiocese. The Episcopal Conference is administered by someone that's selected right now in the USCCB, that's Archbishop Gomez, who is also the archbishop who oversees the Los Angeles archdiocese. And this last level down is the term that I use diocese for, but there's a lot of different types of these that I mentioned. There's all these different mission territories. So those include things like apostolic vi vicariates. And then the blue on this map shows archdiocese and the red is regular diocese. So when I use the term diocese, I'm really referring to this kind of general level. And none of this had been visualized before. Why it matters is maps allow us to see land. They're kind of like the blueprints for the earth. And if we look back in history, I don't think there have been two forces that have really influenced human interaction and civilization's development as land and religion. The way that we relate to the world around us and the resources, and also the way that we relate to a cosmology, to a narrative of our humanity's existence and morality. Not only are these two powerful forces in civilization, but they're necessary right now. So about a third of the earth is habitable land, the rest is mountains, deserts, inhabitable. And about 8% of the habitable land on earth is owned by faith-based organizations. This isn't just the Catholic church, this is all faith-based organizations as estimated by the UN and 5% of commercial forests are owned by faith-based organizations. There's not just monasteries and chapels, there's oil wells, there's farms, there's actually entire mountains. I kid you not, there's a country that got in contact with me, the bishops there, because priests were giving away mountains to their relatives and it was quite problematic. The Catholic Church owns a lot of land and it's different iterations around the world as well. And it's not just the Catholic Church. Many religions have a strong legacy that is tied to the land that they use to, to serve and to worship. And what this means really is if we think about 8% of the habitable land on earth is we are not going to address the biodiversity crisis or the climate crisis, these interconnected challenges that we face, unless we get faith-based institutions on board with a solution to use what they have right now to transform it, to make land work for good. The great news is there's al already a moral impetus, which we saw in Pope Francis's environmental encyclical Laudato Si, to make sure that we use our land, that we use everything that we have, our talents and our gifts, to steward God's creation. So 8% of the habitable land on Earth, just for reference, the size of that's about a little bit larger than India and Sudan combined. It's massive. And as I mentioned before, 
there's a lot of Catholics in the world, about 18% of the population. The Catholic healthcare system is the largest non-governmental system of healthcare in the world, about a quarter of healthcare facilities, the largest network of education, and second in humanitarian aid to the United Nations. And so the land that they own throughout this network can cause a tremendous amount of impact, not just only in its use, but thinking about healthcare and the carbon footprints and the amount of resources used within that, that sector. Together, this land is gonna be critical for not only addressing climate change, but for addressing humanitarian aid and migration that we're going to be facing. I found a good lens to address this and the whole time I was finding good lands, it wasn't some great entrepreneurial vision. It's my second company, but um, and my first one is still operating. But good lands was really started with me going, there must be somebody doing this. This is so logical and this is such a big gap in work. And to my surprise, there wasn't. And the existing economic models that drive conservation didn't work for a property portfolio or a multitude of them that didn't pay taxes on their land in most parts of the world. So Goodlands, the model that I developed and the organization was created to address this. I originally started in agriculture um, and this is one of the designs that I've made. Um, some of them have been implemented. I studied ecological design in graduate school and this shows how you can take a parish, it looks pretty like, your typical suburban parish and transform it into a verdant space that does uses the land to its full potential for the community, for the eco ecosystem, and also for the economic viability of the place. So I'm not going to go too deep into this, but um, you'll have copies of the slides if you want. Um, this is just kind of an example of how that barren space can be transformed using a trail loop to bring a space for people to exercise, to nurture their bodies and their minds and restore their connection with creation. Or another example would be a flexible lot or greenhouses or even an event site where people can create food security, increase economic stability of the site. Or you could have a sports field, a community garden, contemplative gardens, places where people in the community can really gather, a playground, where it creates more than just a parish, but actually a verdant, living, thriving community center that's not just used on Sundays, but available to increase the well being of an entire community and ecosystem. But the challenge with this was that to scale that, we needed to create a classification system. So that's what we did to ensure that properties that couldn't afford this type of planning or work would be able to know what should be done, where it should be done. So an entire diocese could look at all, say, 500 properties within their boundaries and jurisdiction and make sure that they actually plant trees where they are going to live and where they make the most impact, that they put conservation easements where they matter, that they can make up for the financial losses from that with other sites, and that they can understand, actually, some of our projects have been education, so understanding schools, they're opening, they're closing access by different students and how to ensure that Catholic education is accessible where it's the most needed. This allowed us to build a program that looked at these baseline kind of properties that we classified of the church and then map onto it the solutions that could enhance them, whether it's basic, as I mentioned, like conservation or if it's something more complex, like an allotment with food security. By taking that big vision, we could then further scale it from just one diocese and all of its properties to the global church. That's why I was looking for the map of dioceses that we were focused and our mission is oriented to land. By having this kind of vehicle, you could say, or this container of data, it allows us to take what we learn about one diocese and reapply it in similar ones. So to actually illustrate that, you can imagine one diocese has paved surfaces and it's very urban and it has a really large population and it has a delicate ecosystem on the coast. 
the analyses that we use to understand the properties there and their potential can be reapplied in a similar diocese, making it much more accessible, much more affordable, and much more scalable in a time-sensitive way, which is really important in the face of climate change and biodiversity loss. So this is showing we create kind of packages for similar dioceses. And in addition to ecology, I mentioned we take into account market data, so what the real estate is worth, but also um, looking into the social potential as well, and also political situations, because sometimes this data needs to be really secure. While we are helping dioceses around the world map their property, we don't own that data. That would be really risky. So we help them um, understand how to manage it and use it, and they actually own the property scale data. The only place we, we have that data internally at Goodlands is for the United States. So just to kind of summarize the reason why we make maps, the reason why I ended up being the Pope's unofficial map lady was you can't really plan or manage land without maps. And just showing here, this is a map of the green infrastructure potential of all Catholic properties in the US, CCV. Um, so this allows you to really see the potential of say how habitat connectivity can be enhanced by properties. That data though is really valuable for a multitude of goals beyond the environment and obviously including pastoral planning um, and program planning. So we make sure that we stand up a system so that dioceses can actually manage that information so that this information can then expand and multiply its impacts through supporting healthcare, humanitarian aid, and these other networks that can really benefit from it. Why does that matter? When you know where you are and what you have, not only is that environmental context critical for making decisions regarding, say, where to plant a tree, but it also is really important for understanding the dimension of human ecology, of human health, of human development, and say, implementing healthcare programs or education programs, what's around you, what's around your school. To understand the context and the people of the place enables a lot of improvement within programs and also better collaboration. How I ended up in the Vatican was really because this global view of scaling from this classification of dioceses down to this parcel level where things actually get done, the site scale of, say, an individual parish or school required that this global view, but the Catholic Church, without its map updates since the Holy Roman Empire, really needed some geographic standards and some governance. So um, this is a kind of lengthy area uh, of work that we've done that I'm not going to dive too deep into. But really, um, when you look at any map that the US government releases, whether it's NASA or NOAA um, or even the CIA, every single map goes through somebody called the head geographer for the United States. And he helps the US get a final stamp of approval on how they're going to approve, say, country boundaries, especially the ones that are disputed, like between India and Pakistan. And you can depict this in cartography with like a dotted line versus a solid line. And this is a role that almost every nation in the world has. And the Vatican does not have this, not only for diocese and the jurisdictions of the church, but also their data on countries. So how I ended up in the Vatican was not only to get permission to do the first project, but also to help um, really move forward geographic standards and bring geography there into the modern age from the frescoes because this was the state of most of it spread out through different parishes and dioceses around the world. So how, how I got here <laughs> um, to this kind of um, space of making land work for good, I've hinted at some pieces of this, but um, the journey itself, I want to just kind of walk, walk you through it, especially because you're in high school and um, while I was working on this presentation, it really brought me back to just a sense of awe um, and gratitude and amazement at the unexpected twists and turns of life. So I was born in New York City in 1989, so I'm like not that old, but I'm a little old. Um, and then my family moved up to Buffalo, New York, where I am right now. And in Buffalo, New York, uh, so we moved there when I was about two, 
that's where I got most of my education. Um, so this is the high school I attended. It's called City Honors School. It's a public school, public magnet school in, in Buffalo. Um, and it was in the middle of actually a bunch of projects. So um, it was kind of sketchy neighborhood, really awesome school though. Um, and it was ranked fourth in the nation for public schools when I was there. And it was just this amazing collection um, of just talented teachers and also students. Uh, Buffalo has a really large refugee population. So students from all over the world. Um, and this is my senior page. <laughs> I dug this out. Um, and when I was in high school, I wasn't the person I think that you would assume would meet the Pope's cartographer or be the Pope's cartographer unofficially, I should say, because I'm still renegotiating. But um, I wasn't like a really good practicing Catholic. My family had, um, we'd gone to church when I was a kid and we stopped going after my first communion. And I was not particularly intelligent. I would say, or at least I wasn't particularly good at school. Um, I was kind of like a BC, A student. Um, I was really into ballet. That's where most of my time was spent, cross-training, leaving school early. Um, and there just wasn't really anything I would say that was that exceptional about me, even though there really is something exceptional about everyone. Um, but based on normal standards, you know, it's pretty run of the mill. Um, and I ended up going to Canisius College in Buffalo after my uh, dance career didn't work out. That's, I was headed on a, a dance career trajectory and an injury sidelined me. And Canisius College is where my mom taught. She's a computer science professor. And leading up to this, I had kind of lived in design programs in a sense. That's how I communicated well was through visual design. And I had taken a biological illustration course um, through Cornell, just a workshop. And I, I thought I would be a scientific illustrator. And I began working in a lab um, in Buffalo studying yeast uh, as a model organism to understand gen genetics and aging theory. And while I was studying aging theory, it really struck me kind of this fearful question almost. What if, what if you cured, say, aging or all diseases? And why would anyone want to live forever? And when I asked that question while I was studying life, but the life sciences, it really brought me to the conclusion that love was the only answer that really fit. And it was also the answer for why I'd want to live tomorrow or any day why we wake up in the morning is either love or hope of love, love for rocks and equations and people or ideas. And that really shifted my entire life. And that's when I became a, pra a practicing Catholic again was through this process of actually studying science um, the meaning of life, the answer to that, which no one really can claim, but for me, it being love was the most perfect poetic answer. And after so much, you know, existential and philosophical pondering about these questions, it was very freeing to kind of just accept that. Um, and the question then in my life really kind of changed to, well, how do you do that? <laughs> And I started studying uh, spiritual direction under a Jesuit priest. Um, so spiritual direction is when you pray and you learn how to pray in a very disciplined sort of way and discern. So discernment, really listening with the ear of heart. And I was a very reluctant kind of next step from Christianity to Catholicism. I actually studied ancient Greek. I read original biblical texts that are the oldest you can find. I translated the creeds of the church. I was pretty intent on convincing all the Jesuits at my school that I was Christian, but I wouldn't be a Catholic. And not surprisingly, I completely lost the argument with Jesuits eventually. And um, it was the best argument I've ever lost in my life. Um, 
it really opened up this new world to me. And in that time, I was doing a lot of service, but it wasn't for a resume or really anything. It was really just to kind of explore how to live that. And I met these nuns. And I, I should say, I, I co-founded my first company at the time, which is a worker-owned cooperative vertical farm. So that means the workers own the company. So the more profits it makes, the more of that money goes into the pockets of the workers and the CEO, not just the CEO or not just the shareholders. It's an amazing business model that was actually started by a priest in Spain. And additionally, this company that I co-founded that still operates, it's called Cooperative, the worker-owned vertical farm cooperative. It sells fresh microgreens and fish. It's one of those kind of indoor farming systems where the fish and their waste gives vital nutrients up to the plants and the plants clean the water and that water goes back to the fish. And this really started to open my mind into systems planning and also to the power of food and of agriculture in our, not just kind of addressing climate change, but in our communities. My time volunteering in soup kitchens and old folks homes was really moving and transformative. But at the same time, I saw we were giving people sandwiches on white bread, uh, you know, spaghetti um, that had lots of sugar in the sauce. It just wasn't healthy. And these people really deserved to have healthy food. And how could we ensure that communities could have access to that and also create sustainable jobs in the process? So this was the first real foray into that. And one of my co-founders is still, he's now the CEO of the company. And at the same time, I started discerning vocations. Um, once I had lost the arguments with the Jesuits and was becoming Catholic, um, because I really kind of fell in love with God. Um, and I know that this might sound corny to some of you. If I was in high school listening to this talk, I would be rolling my eyes right now. Um, but I, how there's a prayer that talks about falling in love with God is a final kind of way to fall in love. Um, it's really loving love and it's self-reflective and I don't do it perfectly. I still have to discern. Um, but that's why I felt called to be a nun because that's kind of their vocation um, with Christ. And um, while I was at the monastery, I couldn't stop looking at the land every day and thinking about those same issues that my startup was addressing, of food security, of health, and all the people I was working with in their ministries and the potential to work with it, to make land work for good and to multiply every impact of their ministries, but also improve their ecosystem's health. It's a lot of issues like the ground was eroding. And this is something that you can fix easily with the right plantings, with roots that go in and secure soil. There is issues with invasive species, so species that aren't from the area, that have no competitors, that outcompete the local ecosystem's plants. And all of this could have been helped through better land management. Not only that, things like a sustainable forest plan could have actually helped this community generate a revenue. So that's how I went to school to be a farmer nun, a, to graduate school, I should say. Um, I discerned, I was actually invited to Rome during my senior year of college um, and to work under um, the, uh, Aleppe Center um, with Father Rupnik and his community. And he is, Father Rupnik is a mosaic artist. So I was kind of torn between, should I be an artist or, or what about this whole social justice side? And I ended up turning down going to Rome the first time and going to a small graduate school in a barn in Western Massachusetts that had a really solid reputation, but was not the traditional path at all. It's really where permaculture in the Northeast United States um, had its main educational hub. So permaculture is sustainable agriculture in a sense. And from there, it's been this amazing journey then um, to Esri, to the Vatican and back. Um, when I look back um, to where I was in high school, just even all the things that I've learned have just been so interesting. And the whole journey, I think for me, it's just been awesome. And it's inspiring because I didn't go against the grain. That's not, you shouldn't intentionally do that. We should, I just went 
with myself. I guess once I figured that out, and it's still a process, but I don't mean like in this like very, I hope not, maybe it is, but in a very like self-centered way, but really in this like, oh, understanding what my strengths were or my weaknesses and what I really enjoyed to do and how I even enjoyed learning. Um, and through the process, I would say after high school for me, I really had this like renaissance with learning. Um, I just, I wasn't good at math in school and I met this logician and he, I took a class with him and I learned how to actually do math and I fell in love with it. You know, you learn all these kind of different approaches and I figured out how to study um, in a way that worked for me, which I didn't figure out really well in high school. And I figured out how to kind of let go of the stress of not being perfect and just embrace the reality of what was um, and really take time, I would say, to really enjoy the opportunity to explore this amazing world and use that opportunity to not only explore with wonder, but also to protect it for future generations because it's really actually interesting and fun to do it. Um, and we each have a unique way that we can in the future. <clears throat> I'm very hopeful from what I've seen, um, not only from my work and the people I've been exposed to, um, not only from being a woman who has worked with the Vatican since she was 26, which is almost unprecedented, uh, you know, as far as being young, a young woman or even an old woman, just any sort of woman um, goes, it's really was unheard of. I'm also really hopeful because of your generation. I've met through programs with like the United Nations, you know, being a youth leader, um, sometimes, you know, between the ages of 18 to 30, um, I end up meeting people right near your ages. And it's just, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, the future is very open for solutions and they're more needed than ever. And taking, you know, this drive and this courage that comes, I would say, partially from the fear um, has just shown me a generation coming that is just more creative, intelligent, and curious, and just than perhaps anything we've seen um, in history so far. So I, I'm really encouraged and excited, and uh, let's make land work for good. Thank you, Molly, for that wonderful presentation. I think I speak for everyone when I say that I'm nothing short of impressed by all your accomplishments and visions and just your overall, overall demeanor and journey as a young woman. So thank you. Uh, we are now going to shift into the Q&A portion of the program. Our goal is to get to as many questions as possible, but of course I apologize if we can't get to every question. So we're going to start off with um, a couple questions that we received prior to today's program. But as Ms. Lebeck noted, please feel free to type in any question that may have arisen into the chat um, or feel free to raise your hand um, and ask a question live if that's more your style. But to start off, Molly, um, what initially motivated your ambitions to combat global warming? <clears throat> well, it was really the local scale that I mentioned, like the soup kitchen and the food and having healthy food and healthy jobs. Um, on a global scale, I, I, it was really, that was the accident of it all where I was like, I honestly wouldn't have had like the guts to have just gone out and like been like, yeah, I'm gonna make the first global map of the Catholic church. I'm gonna meet the Pope and I'm gonna, no way. I was just like, I'm gonna go find the people doing this. And I just kept going because I said, gosh, I must find, I, there's gotta be someone here. So. I guess the motivation was partially naivety to my uh, favor now that I look back, but yeah. The happy accident. <laughs> yeah, and I guess I, I would say though the courage to do it because it has been really intimidating. I mean, I didn't just like the whole thing. The first time I was in a newspaper even, I was like, oh my gosh, I went and like deleted my live journal and my MySpace from from high school. I actually wrote a, a really good blog post, I think, on on Mercy, 
and like growing up in the digital age because i think that was one of the limitations was like how can i meet the pope when i've like talked about like not getting a prom date and it's on the internet you know and i just remember being like this whole litany of my life being there online and thinking i'm gonna be there's gonna be trolls like everyone's gonna be mean if this works and i think the courage really came from just the crisis level to be honest it was kind of like well well if there really isn't anyone doing this why not it's huge this problem and in the small chance that no one was i just i kind of got the impetus i would say from like okay like someone's got to do it like <laughs> i'll be shocked if i can pull it off or at least contribute in any way but that's really incredible <laughs> um next question um what is your favorite part of your current job? Management, really strangely, actually, because I'm, I'm like a designer by nature. Um, I understand things visually. I love laying them out. I like started using Adobe design products when I was really young and continue in a multitude of design programs to even think. I consider it almost like a, a crutch in some ways. Um, so design is part of it, but management, I love it. And I, when I was that, in that lab, I actually had access to all 3000 staff at Esri at their headquarters. And these were tech, like really, you know, people doing technical back end things, infrastructure, all the way up to the company composer. And I just, everything they did was so interesting. I like got to live vicariously through them um, because I was 26. These were all, you know, seasoned pros, <laughs> like the world's best. So I couldn't even pretend like, oh yeah, I'm here and I know more than you. So it was like this wild educational experience to work with them. But I found that I love management in that sense because it was really humbling. You just, you know, are working to, it's like a garden. You know, you position people with their talents like you would a, a plan in a way where they can thrive and they're their own person or I, a garden might be the wrong, like an orchestra conductor. And everything is just so beautiful in its own, right? And the the job is just to, help you know piece together the larger vision and show everyone why they matter in that and that's surprising though <laughs> for me i didn't think management would be like a really fun thing but interesting um okay next question so have you personally seen the plans you designed for the diocese, diocese implemented and come to fruition Yes, actually, well, some of them. So like the global maps have been a big part of this and a lot of it has been R&D. So that's research and development. And we're going to the next phase of expanding from a team of contractors to finally actually having a full-time team, God willing, this next year. Uh, so we've I've worked with up to 50 contractors kind of expanding and our diocese projects, our di diocesan projects, I should say, um, have all the ones that have been implemented that aren't like long term strategies like environment with trees being planted have all been education related actually. <laughs> they were kind of like getting in the door of like, okay, so we'll map what you own, we'll figure out how to do this. And it doesn't matter what the goal is initially, we can build on that to environmental. And so they were all about actually Catholic schools that were run by dioceses. Um, and we have seen that it helped actually keep a couple schools open. Uh, showing that these were areas where there are a lot more younger populations going up in demographics, where there was a lot of need. So there was a, a failing public school in the area was one of the criteria we were looking at. So like the absolute, like most dire areas for a Catholic school, um, where it's not saying that's the only area, but the most dire were pretty much like areas that had no good public school um, and had a lot of kids going there and no real options um obviously tuitions and stuff is like based on some demographic modeling in those areas too so um we've eight there's eight new catholic schools that are performance-based that have come out of that so that's like the real metric i can do there's a lot of like just a land record alone can help like save an institution from a land grab in some countries so it's really hard to measure these i hope we'll figure out how to measure it better because it is like just the baseline data alone is really i don't know what it's doing fully um in that domain yeah such a daunting task um so 
for the next two questions, we actually have two questions from language teachers, sort of niche questions. So I received a chat from my Spanish teacher who wants to know if you know the name of the pr the priest in Spain who invented the coop. Uh, it was in Mondragon, Spain. And I don't know the name off the top of my head. But if you Google Mondragon and work own cooperatives, you'll be able to find it. Got it, got it. And then um, a question from a Latin teacher who wants to know, did Hildegard impact you on your journey in any way? She's such a fan of both of you. Absolutely. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Hildegard on the call, she is a 11th or she was in the 1100s is when she lived and she is a German mystic, abbess, Benedictine, um, and woman of many hats. She like wrote her own language of the bird. She composed all this music. She also wrote plays that were done for more moral plays. It was like actually the first one of the first like kind of moral Christian plays being acted out in theater. Um, and she wrote to the Pope. So she had the courage to do that back then. And uh, yeah, so she definitely influenced me. She's like a really, really like awesome. She's my confirmation saint too. So Hildegard is, is really, yeah. Awesome. Um, next question. Um, Molly, your path shows a lot of courage and willingness to be true to your heart's desire. Can you name what helped you be someone who is even aware of what your heart's desire is, let alone having courage to pursue it? Yeah, it's kind of like the fleeting now sometimes. Like, I mean, getting to the core though, which is, you know, I think part of it was getting to almost, I don't know how to describe it other than like the quanta. I mean, it was devastating for me when I was 18 and, and the career I had worked for my entire life since I was like five, dance. You know, that was all that I really knew. And that was taken away. I was like, I don't have any idea who I am. Um, and I, in that space though, which is, I think something that happens to most people at some point in their careers, like there's a career change, you know, and I was y too young to like have identities really built around something else, um, was that I had to figure out that, okay, uh, there's this African proverb um, and it's, if you can walk, you can dance. If you can talk, you can sing. Um, and I had to, kind of, I could never let go of dance. So I had to embody dance and choreography. And I, it, that helped me grow from that space and actually realize that it was really more of an evolution of self um, to get, as you get to know kind of your heart um, and not, rather than like a, a an, I would say an evolution rather than some sort of like, you know, blotting out or death of some former dream, it really just changes and knowing like what's at the absolute core. To get there, I would say um, it took like, a, it was difficult. I think the saints, right, like talk about that. Like it's, it's not always easy, but like in those moments of struggle, you're actually learning. And that, that was one of the things that I learned. Like if you can keep awareness, you know, there are lessons, really important lessons like that kind of finding the core of, if you can walk, you can dance. Even if you can't walk, you can dance. Um, and with the land stuff is, I would say the discernment. So uh, I mentioned the St. Ignatius's exercises, totally like the best thing I learned in college, to be honest. And like, I am a total geek and like, I love rocks and stuff, but like St. Ignatius's exercises, if that was the only thing I got out of college, that would have been the, the best thing I could have gotten. And if you are heading off to college next year, like if there are, you know, you have to make sure, try to find, you know, you can, just anyone becoming a spiritual director is not necessarily like a, a you have to discern that too. Um, but so I was lucky to have really, really good Jesuits at my school uh, that were willing to like, grapple with me about faith but also um I, I started meditating just totally silent prayer as i was kind of becoming a christian um, i was actually studying buddhism and practicing buddhism for two years leading up to it um 
and I think the silence, like just creating space for silence, like it's really strange, but like it really cultivates something. And I think it, it changes like your neurochemistry even, you know, like, so the silence and then and then the discernment of spirits, the, the prayer that I would say like in that is absolutely like hands down critical um, for me is called the examine, the examination of conscience. And it's really like this very merciful reflection on your day where you like invite like the presence of God in in love and you just kind of like have that mercy there so you can like honestly look back without judgment but also like see oh this could be better tomorrow and like oh this is what I felt and like just that mindfulness like really just like even taking you know a moment at the end of the day just like changes everything. That's great thank you. So we're going to try to get to around two or three more questions. Um, so next up, what is your next step if your contract with the Vatican is not renewed? And how will you continue your work and, and go around that obstacle if that happens? Yeah, so I actually, I just got back from Rome and I gave a pretty hard like boundary there this time to, um, because I mean, I've been trying to negotiate this for two years. So with that clarity that I gave them, I feel like I, I have been carrying this cross of geographic standards and being like HQ for Catholic geography globally. Um, there's kind of like a release because they have my proposal, they know what they need to do and they can come talk to me if they want. I'm not gonna fly back to Rome. I'm not gonna spend money and do that. You know, it's kind of there. And the next step, you know, if they come to us, I am ready. We already have the staff lined up for it. It will be awesome. And it's also really just the fundamental, you know, um, policy is just so important. Like, I guess the fear would be, it's not really fear, but it would be kind of like ridiculous. But, you know, what could easily happen is they get a priest uh, uh, because it's still a very, very, almost everyone that works there is, is a guy. I mean, having a woman found an institution, nevertheless run one, when they just appointed like the woman to be the head of the synod, or the I should say the secretary undersecretary, and now they have another woman who's running the Vatican City State uh, Secretary for General Affairs. Like, what I was asking for was wild, and the fact the Pope said yes the first time was wild. So we're gonna see if they say yes, I will be so happy. Like just for the church, even just to like get this done. But if they don't, Goodlands has a lot of projects lined up and a lot of demand, including like there's a group, a religious group in Canada, for example, that's dealing with indigenous reconciliation with the boarding schools. Like, and maps allow you to kind of like have a dialogue. So we're ready to take on all these projects. We're actually going to expand. We have governments approaching Goodlands and do a hybrid nonprofit for profit model so they can be sustainable. Um, a, a good analogy is Catholic healthcare um, serves everyone that comes in the door. Uh, it's Catholic is not like a kind of, you know, a category of a market. I hate to use these like overly business terms, but a market, unless you're selling rosaries, really, it's like Catholic education. You don't have to be Catholic to go to Catholic school and you can get a great education. You don't have to be Catholic to go to Catholic hospital and you should get excellent healthcare. And the same for Catholic environmental services. You don't have to be Catholic to use what we have anyone that has a large network of properties should be able to benefit from it. So we'll be expanding, hopefully closing the next round of investment and hiring full-time now, a bunch of the people I've been working with over the years. So yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of, I'm like really overwhelmed with opportunities right now too, if that, but so yeah, that's what we're doing is just expanding the services and really going for the diocese that, and groups that are asking already. That's incredible. We're all rooting for you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so another question is, are there other opportunities you've encountered in the Catholic Church where we can modernize and perhaps centralize resources and knowledge on a global scale other than cartography and land? Well, data infrastructure, I'm not really going to get into that because it's really not very interesting for most people, but it's really, it's kind of like, um, like a sewer system for a city, like where you turn on the faucet and you know, you're going to get potable water and the stuff behind it is like standards 
and pipes and you know treatment plants and then the actual water source like a data infrastructure is allows you to like turn on the faucet and know you're getting good quality data um that's that's one way that's um that would enable consolidation collaboration actually i uh, outside of mapping there's def there's so much like software scraping like old documents you can like that project i mentioned of of like country scale stuff we had to use uh develop like vision based software with um machine learning so figuring out how to extract these really like kind of messy texts coming out of the vatican in like five different languages i mean there's a lot there was that um Gosh, I'm blanking on his name. The the saint, the young fellow, blessed. Um, he he's like the patron saint of the internet. He's like he passed away pretty young, and he's one of the more recent saints, modern saints. And he made a database of Eucharistic miracles. Like there are ways, that, and you can just like there's so much to geek out about in the Catholic Church. Like the calendar, if you want to like explore data and time, like that is very fun. It's a lot more fun than like it sounds to be honest it is wild the liturgical calendar and the history is amazing there's there's so many you know i i would just awesome opportunities um in the church right now it's not financially feasible like um you know we created that data set and we worked with david cheney who's the guy who runs catholic hierarchy so he's been mining and mapping or he hasn't mapped we mapped but he has been kind of stewarding all this data so there's a lot of these like data stewards i call them the the like knowledge management monks and the like sister stewards of data like they have a vocation but there's no funding for them and there's no support so i'm like i'm hopeful that it will come back you know it seems like a very kind of like monastic thing you know like scribes but now database developers but yeah. Great. I think we're going to end with one last question. Um, what can we do as high school students to help the environment? Oh, there's, there's a lot. Um, one is just talking about it, you know, um, with your families, I would say with each other too, because if you're just like reading the news, um, it can be really depressing. So when you actually talk to each other, it can be like really empowering. Um, planting trees in the right places of the right species um, can be a great uh, program. If you plant them in like an inner city place where there isn't greenery, that can have a big impact. Um, mapping. So ESRI ESRI, um, the software that we use, they actually have donated it to access to all schools and homeschool students. So you could even do mapping projects in school with access to it. Um, you could do a cleanup obviously like picking up trash. I know this is cliche, but it actually helps, um, you know, and advocating, you know, writing to to government, uh, to, you know, whoever your representatives are to advocate for um, including like environmental uh, legislation. Those are like the, the big things I, I can think of off the top of my head. Oh, just like community locally, like is really important part of, I think, um, ecological conversion. So, yeah. Thank you, Molly. I think that wraps up our Q&A portion of the program. And just thank you so much for giving such thoughtful and thorough answers. And I'm going to now hand the mic over to Ms. Levesque. Thank, thank you, you so Sarah. much, Sarah. Sarah, thank you for the wonderful job that you did as our moderator and host tonight. Just, just great. You handled that all so beautifully. And Molly, um, you know, I was in our view when I initially read the article in the New Yorker back in uh, February, um, and even more so now. Um, it's just remarkable to to come to know you a little bit better through tonight's Zoom call, and I'm sure all of my friends and colleagues here and students and all feel the same way. So thank you so very much for sharing your story with us. Um, the word inspirational doesn't quite do it justice, but we're just delighted to have you with us. Um, the beauty of tonight's presentation is that it has been recorded. And so students who were unable to see it tonight um, will be able to see it perhaps in some classes coming up in the uh, weeks ahead. So again, uh, the Molly Burns story will live on at Ursuline. I would not be surprised at all if you hear from some of our science teachers who might say, hey, could you give us some ideas on a project or whatever? So stay yeah. tuned.
Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely send the questions my way. Um, and it's just been an absolute honor to be with you all tonight. I'm really grateful. Thank you, Molly. Um, part of our mission statement, Molly, says that we are educating young women to educate or to um, engage in their communities with purpose and presence. And I think your lived example of that is a remarkable example for all of us, both our students and those of us who are adults. So uh, you have certainly taken your God-given talents and brought them to have impact on the world in such a positive way. So thank you for what you're doing. It's, it shows us what's possible with one person and a great deal of passion and idea. This is our, as I said at the beginning tonight, our 75th anniversary speaker series. Um, we have a few more dates coming up for Ursuline things that we'd like folks to keep in mind. Um, our folks in the advancement team are hard at work putting together our Ursuline's Gut Talent, which is our gala for this year. It will again be a virtual presentation, but those of you who are with us last year will know what fun it was. So I invite you to spend a, an hour or so with us on Sunday evening, December 12th for our Ursuline Gala. It's, uh, you'll see a lot of talent, I have to tell you, from both our present students and from our alumni. And then our next speaker, and as part of our speaker series, will be Dr. Lisa Damore, who is a psychologist and best-selling author, um, who's uh, known for her books, particularly on helping young folks manage stress and anxiety. So uh, there'll be plenty of advanced publicity coming out about uh, Dr. Lisa Damore. As always, I need to thank all of the people who made this evening possible. Behind every Ursuline event that we put on, there are legions of folks who work behind the scenes, who spread the word, who do the graphics, all of the many ways. So to all of my colleagues tonight who made tonight such a success, I thank each and every one of you. Um, as we move through the season of Advent, may all of you know a spirit of hope and peace. And most of all, please stay healthy. So thank you again for being with us this evening. Molly and Sarah, hats off to both of you for the wonderful jobs that you did and uh, be well. Thanks again from everyone at Ursuline. <laughs>